first six months of the year are gone. They're in the past. Looking forward to Christmas. Has everyone done their Christmas shopping? You only have 160-some-odd days now to do your Christmas shopping. So can you guys watch the mics there? Thank you. Turn me down a little bit. So glad to have you with us at Alconbury Independent Baptist Church. And for those online, glad you could be with us this morning. So if you take your hymnals this morning, turn to number 267. Or you can see on the overhead, 267, Come Thou Almighty King. Let's stand and sing this morning. Come Thou Almighty King. Quieten our hearts before the Lord and come to him in prayer. Almighty God, we have just sung about your greatness, about your majesty, and about your unlimited power. We know that it is by your word that you created the heavens and the earth and called them into being. We know that every living creature has been made by you and is sustained by you, Lord, Despite man's uh, attempts to destroy and pollute and corrupt this world with sin, you have remained faithful and true to your word that all things will remain until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we gather together in his name, we gather together to worship you, to love, honor, and adore you, for you alone are worthy of our praise. And so we thank you, Lord God, that we have been able to wake up this morning and, and come here, Lord, with the strength and grace that you give us day by day, that whatever comes before us to do, Lord, you help us to cope with that through your almighty power. And we know, Lord God, that you have revealed your love for us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for him, and we thank you that he came to this earth, leaving the glories of heaven and uh, knowing in advance that he would suffer such terrible agony at the hands of sinful men and in the end be nailed to a cross to bleed and to die for our sins. And we thank you for this privilege of knowing you. We thank you for his glorious resurrection when he rose from the dead. And so, Lord, as we gather together, we ask that your Holy Spirit may meet with us, may move in the rows, touching lives, bringing people to faith and others to repentance and still others to be restored to fellowship with you. We pray for those fellow believers throughout the world who are struggling, who have to meet in secret to, to worship you, Lord God, uh, under threat of their lives and threat of violence 
Lord, that you would sustain and keep them and bless them, and that uh, they may be even stronger and more courageous because of those threats made to them. And so, Lord, we commit our missionaries to you. We thank you for their faithful service for you. We thank you for the people that have heard the gospel because of their efforts. And we ask that you would continue to supply their, their every needs. And we thank you for the privilege that we have in this church of supporting those missionaries who take the word to places where we cannot be. And so, Lord, we commit the preaching of your word to, to you today. We ask that you would give power and strength to the speaker and anoint him with your grace and your blessing. We pray for those who are uh, grieving the loss of loved ones, those who are struggling with illness, health issues, family-related issues, uh, work-related issues, whatever the problems are, Lord, that, that they may feel your presence being very close to them and that above all they may turn to you in faith and commit their lives to you. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So some of you may ask what I'm, you see what I'm wearing today, the colors. So this is Patriotic Sunday in America, because it's the Sunday before July 4th that happens to fall on a Wednesday this week. So we are 242 years young as a nation in the U.S., escaping the tyranny and oppression of the King of Britain. But what's interesting is today we are allies and friends. Right? See where we've come from all these years? You know, I was thinking about, you know, um, if you go back to that time, you think the reason, the cause for the people leaving. See, no man uh, has the right to be a dictator and a ruler over another man. Right? We have freedom. So our ruler and our king is Jesus Christ. God gave us the right to freely worship. And that's one of the biggest reasons we left and went to America. But today we are friends and allies, and there's freedom here today. So glad to see all of you out today. And so that's why I wear the colors. Thankful to be born in a nation, even here in Britain, where you have the freedom to assemble and worship freely. You know, give God the glory for that. All right. So let's stand. Let's turn to number 262. Sing holy, holy, holy.
seated. If you'd open your Bibles with me this morning to Acts chapter 3, the Acts of the Apostles. I'll give you just a minute to get there. Acts chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 15 this morning. Very familiar passage. And let's begin. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up. And walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them into the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel... Why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One, And the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Amen. Again, a very familiar passage this morning. We thank God for his word that he's left us today. Let's stand and we're going to sing our third song here, number 206. Hymn number 206. Praise God, there is a Redeemer. Amen.
have a word of prayer before we dismiss the children out to their little lesson this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that you sent your Son to be our Redeemer, Lord. We were lost, away from you, separated, with no hope. But, Father, you sent that hope, Lord, that sure hope that we have in Jesus Christ to be the sacrifice, Lord, for our sin, to reconcile us unto you. And, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, as we look back and we think, Lord, about how good you've been to us as a people. Lord, you've uh, kept your word here. Lord, you've kept your promises. You've preserved your word through all these generations. Father, we give you praise and glory for that. We pray for the children this morning, Lord, that you would bless their time that they have in your word, Lord. Pray that they would listen, they would glean something, Lord, as the word is broken to them this morning in their classroom. Be with those who, again, who are away from us today, those who are traveling, those maybe who are shut in, Lord, and cannot get here. And we pray you'd minister to them through even the uh, services online that they may be watching this morning. We thank you for all these things now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And children, you may be dismissed. Well, it's good to be with you here this morning. We're turning in our Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and we're asking ourselves that question that we've been asked for the last few weeks. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? And the text, the key text, is found in Acts chapter 3 and verse 15. Acts chapter 3 and verse 15. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. Let's hear God's word. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the word before us. We're thankful that you've preserved the word up to this moment. We're thankful, Lord, that you have given us of your Holy Spirit to inspire Struck and to inspire men who are carried along by the Holy Ghost to write down the very words of God. We're thankful, Lord, we have the words this morning before us and we can read it and we can meditate upon it and we can study it. But Lord, no matter how much intellectual power we may use, we need the Spirit of God to open our minds and to understand the very truth of God. And so we pray, Lord, that the Prince of Life would, as it were, be so potent and so patent to us this morning, so we would know that the Prince of Life, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in this place, and we are gathered here to worship and hallow his holy name. We pray, Lord, for those listening in online. We pray we'd be a blessing to them, just as they have been a blessing to us over the last few months. And we pray, O Lord, most of all, that Jesus Christ will be exalted, not only in this service, not only in this church, but in this area, in this community, people, boys and girls and grown-ups would come to the various meetings over the next month, especially the Holiday Bible Club, and that, O oh Lord, you would bring in children from the schools round about to hear the message of life, the message of grace, the message of the love of Jesus Christ. We ask all these mercies in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Well, friends... Peter doesn't waste any words. This text, the Prince of Life, is a very important text. I was going to do an overview of the last six studies, but the Lord just wants me to preach on this text this morning, so bear with me. We're, as it were, in Jerusalem. We're a few days, 40 days plus, a few more, after the resurrection, Ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into glory. We have had a wonderful sermon preached by the servant Peter. We've had read, we could read of the anointing of the coming of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost Sunday. 
And you'd think with all that excitement and all these things happening, that people would be thrilled at what the Lord does here in this miracle. Maybe in a few weeks' time we look at the miracle itself. The background is wonderful. It's a, a man who is lame and he's begging at the Solomon's Gate, at the Gate Beautiful. And as he's begging, he sees these two disciples. Have we got a flick? No. Oh, there we go. Miracle at Gate Beautiful. It's a wonderful miracle. This poor beggar who's forlorn and forsaken. He's been carried day after day to the temple to beg. He's outside the temple. And he sees these two men, Peter and John, and he knows they're apostles. And he begs of them too. And if you went to Sunday school at all, if you ever led a children's work, I almost chose one of the, this hymn this morning. Maybe next time we'll have it. If we have the miracle, we'll have this little chorus. Peter and John went to pray. They met a lame man on the way. He asked for alms. That means he begged. He held out his palms. And this is what Peter did say. It's there in the scriptures in verse 6. But this is how the song, this chorus goes. Silver and gold have I none, but all that I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Who healed the man? It wasn't himself. He didn't have the power. It certainly wasn't the religious leaders because they're incensed. It wasn't an angel because Peter tells us. It certainly wasn't the apostles because they had no power in themselves to do such a thing. Peter tells them. He tells them. He tells the man. And the Holy Spirit made sure that we know who healed this man. It was Jesus Christ. In this name, through faith, and this is chapter 3 of Acts and verse 16, and his name through faith and his name hath made that man strong whom you see, ye know, ye the faith which is by him hath given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It's Jesus Christ that healed the man. It was in the name of Jesus Christ. It was in the power of Jesus Christ. It was through the man's faith in Jesus Christ. It wasn't faith in faith. It wasn't faith in religion. It was faith in the name. Faith in the man. Christ Jesus, our blessed Savior and the Son of God who became man. He did it. And then, Peter launches into this amazing sermon. And we're just going to unpack it for a few moments this morning. I've given you the key text. Oh, thank you for those at the back. They killed, and this is our key text. You can underline it. I've got it in green highlighter. If you're in the habit of mar marking your Bible, I want you to mark this little phrase. And killed the prince of life, whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And killed the prince of life. I want us to think this morning about the Prince of Life. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Life, who lived and died and rose again, and He's alive today, and is alive forevermore, and He's here this morning by His Spirit. And this is what we're going to consider. The Prince of Life. Sometimes the Lord just stops you in your tracks when you're preparing a sermon. I'm sure those of us who preach will know about this. And we can neither go back, we can neither go forward, we can neither go right, we can neither go left. We have to preach what's in the text. So that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be a very simple outline. Here it is. The, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Life. That's the first thing. And I'll show you from various scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, how important this is. And then we're going to look at the Prince of Life who died. And you need to really keep your finger moving when we're going through various scriptures because the amazing thing is that the Prince of Life died. And then the equally amazing fact is that the Prince of Life rose from the dead. And that's the only reason this church is in existence here this morning. Only reason. 
is the only reason you, dear Christian, are here this morning. Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Hallelujah, what a Savior. So let's look at the Prince of Life. The word Prince got me thinking. Last time I was at Disneyland. I've gone a couple of times, as many of you know. We got out of it. Many things, many experiences. But one thing that struck me was this. Disneyland, by, be it Disneyland Paris or Disneyland Florida or Disneyland Orlando or whatever Disneyland you go to, you go and see princesses. At least that's what little girls do. And not so little girls. Big girls, teenagers, queuing up for hours waiting to meet a princess. But there's no princess. They're not that important. I'm sure if Prince Charming had to queue up, the poor man would have been there all day without ever getting a visit. Nobody wants to visit the prince. And so in our minds, we have this idea of a princess and a prince. And when we come to our Bibles, that's the concept we have, isn't it? Let's be honest. Well, the Bible's full of this truth. The word prince is very interesting. I don't normally do this, but I'm going to do this anyway. So here we go. Here's a little... Um, Add it extra if you like. The word prince comes from the word for, in Latin for principal or prime. Is it do with a principality? Now, do, can you think of a principality in the Great Britain? The principality of Wales. It's a principality. And we have the Prince of Wales. Now, in the past, the Prince of Wales was a very, very powerful figure. But we know who the Prince of Wales is now. He's Charles. We know him by his first name. And he's in the media. And, and his family are in the media. And they're kind of like figureheads. But in the old days, a prince was a ruler. And what he said was done. Now, he wasn't as powerful as a king. He was in line for the throne, of course. This word is related to principality, principle, and prime. If you, your children go to school or if you're part of some organization, sometimes you have a principle. And here we are. It's not P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E, which is an accounting term. It's P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. And so when we come to this concept of prince in the Bible, let's get our fingers going and let's get into Isaiah 9 and verse 6. One of the most well-known texts in all of Scripture, certainly in the, regarding the prince. The Bible says he is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Isaiah here is used of God to prophesy of a, of a prince, of a king, of one who will rule and his reign will have no end. It's very interesting. Everybody has learned that text. Perhaps some of us who like classical music have heard that text sung. George Frederick Hand Handel wrote that wonderful oratorio, The Messiah. It's usually uh, performed at Christmas or Easter. It was first performed in Dublin, which is very interesting. The place called Fishamble Street. It's no longer there, of course. The street's gone, but Dublin's still there. And you can go and see that house, that place where, which has replaced that hall. But here it is. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. This is the Prince of Peace, prophesied by Isaiah. This word prince is also used by Daniel on three occasions. The Lord is to, compared to the prince of the host, the ruler, the captain over all. He's also, that's Daniel 8 and verse 11. And Daniel 8 and 25 is the prince of princes. There's no ruler to be compared to the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. He's also called the Prince Messiah. Daniel 9 and verse 25, this Messiah will restore and rebuild and establish a kingdom will have no end. 
But the same phrase is also used in the New Testament. Our text in Acts 3 and verse 15, we'll come back to that in a moment, but he's also compared to a prince and savior, Acts 5 and verse 31. And then he's the captain of our salvation in Hebrews 2 and verse 10, but it's the same word in the original Greek. He's the archegos. He's the author. He's the prince. He's one who's paved the way for his people. He's forged a path. Reminds me of some of these special operatives that have to go to these countries and forge a path through so that peace may come. Our Lord Jesus has forged a path so that you and I, dear Christian, this morning can have peace with God. And finally, in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, he's the author and finisher of our faith, but it's the same word in the Greek, it's prince. This is the prince. This is my prince. This is my everlasting, glorious, exalted Prince, but is he your prince? Or who is ruling your life? Or who is ruling your heart? You see, the Apostle Peter here knows that these listeners have a very good knowledge of their Old Testament. And so he brings them on a little historical tour. And he reminds them in chapter 3 and verse 13 of Peter, he sa- oh, sorry, Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus. And in the very next phrase, ye delivered him, ye denied him, ye denied the Holy One and the just. And then we come to our phrase, and killed the prince of life. Talk about laying it on heavy. What does it mean for the prince of life? Well, here's four great truths that I glean from the scriptures. I don't have time to go into all the texts, but let me just give you the four main truths I glean. And this is the first. Jesus Christ is the prince of life because he has life by natural right. He has life by natural right. John the Apostle tells us in the first chapter of his uh, gospel that In him was life. He is the creator of the universe. He is the one who gives life to all living things. Even those tiny little dumbbell spiders. Have you seen some of these articles recently in Creation Ministries International? Just little clips. This tiny little spider. And he's got this gift of weaving a web under the water. And he goes up and he gets his food. I won't go into the details because it's it's quite gruesome what he does to his his prey. And he catches his food. And in the same breath, he goes all the way back down and into his little chamber. And he's got 24 hours to eat his meal. And evolutionists are stumped. How on earth can a little spider manage to create this little web that is waterproof, go up, get its food, come back down, and and not drown? Surely all the prototypes would have died in the process. And my Lord Jesus created that tiny little spider. As well as you and me. We have ants in the house. Have you got ants in the house? Got loads of them. They come from everywhere. They come out the walls. They come up the floors. They come everywhere. It's not a plague yet. And there's various remedies that we can deal with them. But Elizabeth, my wife, and I were talking this morning with the children about ants. Well, you think our ants are nasty here? I believe when Elizabeth was a girl... On holidays in Singapore, she told us this, so it must be true. She was walking through a little field. There isn't that much greenery in Singapore if you've ever been there. And she looked down and she saw this 
ant, which was pretty reasonable size, with these huge pincers. And Jesus created that little ant. It might have been a leaf cutter ant because she worked out that those pincers weren't very sharp. Good job. You see, when we think about the Prince of Life, we must start with the fact that Jesus Christ is life itself. Is he speaking here of his eternity? There is no beginning, there is no end to Christ. He's the Prince of Peace in the Old Testament. He's the Prince of Life in the New Testament. And here he is. He gives life to all. There is no living thing in this universe, in God's own universe, that has not derived its existence from God. Secondly, he also gives some other type of life. You see, because he's eternal, and he's glorious, and he's holy, he gives eternal life. eternal life. I don't deserve eternal life and neither do you. You and I deserve eternal death. Not sobering. But it's true. And the Bible says we're in the condemnation. But the Bible also says that Jesus took our condemnation. The Bible says that we face eternal death if we don't trust in Christ. But if we do trust in Christ, we have eternal life. Whosoever believeth on him will not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. Most famous text in the Bible. God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever shall believe it on him shall not perish, but hath everlasting life. The Lord Jesus is the author and finisher of faith, but he's also the giver of eternal life. What is eternal life? Well, we looked at this a few weeks ago, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of revision. It's spiritual life. It's life from God. It's a life that transforms your inner self. It's only granted to you by grace. You can receive it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here this morning, you have eternal life. It's begun. You're living in two worlds. You're already a child of God, and therefore you have eternal life. And if you were to pass from this world into the next at this very moment, you would go straight from this world to the presence of God and enjoy eternal life forever with Him. One old preacher says this, all our preaching is in vain unless Jesus sends forth eternal life. He that has the Son has life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. First John 5 and verse 12. Not only is Jesus Christ, as he got natural, eternal life or life by natural right, he's willing to give this eternal life, but thirdly, he gives it so plenty. There's an Irishman, there's a, an American citizens, there are German citizens, there are Zambian citizens, there are South African citizens, there are Australian citizens, there are English citizens, there are all types of citizens represented here this morning. And many of you have tasted and experienced this eternal life. And the Lord Jesus didn't push you away when you asked for it, did he? He gives it plentifully. And this morning in other parts of the world, the Lord Jesus is bringing a new child of God to birth by the Spirit. The Spirit is at work. Regardless of what we think of in this world and in this area and in this community and in this country, God is still at work. There will be someone at the end of the day that will, or there will be any today will thank the Lord that they were born again of the Holy Spirit and they now have eternal life at the end of this very Sunday. Will your name be amongst them? And the fourth thing he is willing to give us many who will ask this for this life. Or anyone who pleads for it. You see, the first thing you must realize is you must know about it. 
It's very hard to plead to lo- for the Lord to work in your life if you don't know about him. It's very hard to ask the Lord to save you unless you know you need to be saved. It's very hard to ask the Lord, can I, Lord, have this eternal life? Can I have this life from God unless you know about it? But here's the encouragement. He's willing to give it to whosoever will ask him. There's a story told of by Mark Twain. It's of a prince who became an ordinary person and lived like a pauper. Our prince has come to live among us. And while we are to enjoy his fellowship, dear believers, never forget that he is the prince of peace, the prince of life, and our prince and savior. Never forget it. Secondly, he's not only the prince of life, he is the prince of life who died. And this is the thing. And now you have to square two things. The author of eternal life, the one who is life, the one who gave life to all things in this world, gave up his life. Do you get that? I've pondered this all week. I can't get my head around this. It's only by reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures and trying to grasp this concept that the prince of life died. Peter says it to them. And killed the prince of life. This is murder. This is murder in the first degree. This is callous, cruel, undeserved murder. Who killed the prince of life? Well, you could argue, reading John nineteen sixteen and Mark fifteen fifteen, that Pilate, the governor of Judea, he's the one guilty. Because he handed Jesus Christ, he tried and judged Jesus Christ at the praetorium and then sent him to be crucified. But he's not on his own. Because Pilate did not put one nail in Jesus' body. The Roman soldiers did. And of course they were under Pilate's jurisdiction, his authority, and the Roman soldiers in John 19 verse 18 They took him and nailed him to the cross. They did it. And they're guilty. They crucified him and impaled him to the tree. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross. The Roman soldiers had done it many times before him. They would do it many times again. But they would never nail anyone to be compared to Jesus Christ on a cross. Because the one they nailed was innocent, perfect, holy, sinless, and undefiled, and separate from sinners. But then there's the chief priests. And you read your Gospels, and you discover that they colluded with Judas, the betrayer. And they tried him in an illegal midnight court in John's Gospel in verse, chapter 19. And they tried him, and they judged him worthy of death. They accused him of crimes he had not done. They claimed he was blasphemous, which he was not. And they handed him over to Pilate to be crucified. And some of those chief priests, and certainly some of those priests in that very council of murder, were there that day in Jerusalem, seeing God's mighty work in this lame man. And they couldn't deny it. Do you notice how accusatory Peter is, verse 14, chapter 3 of Acts and 14, ye denied him. The Holy One and the just. Ye delivered him. And ye begged of one to be given in exchange. This is all in verse 14. Who's this man who is exchanged? Barabbas, a man who deserved to die. Exchange with one Jesus Christ who did did not deserve to die. The Prince of Life. He was killed. But there's someone else guilty. And I'm one of those number. And so are you, dear Christian. Because our sin nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. Our sin. 
And that's serious. Some people worry when they've eaten too much cake that they've sinned. And that's nothing got to do with the Bible's version of sin. I like my cake. I know there is such a thing as eating too much. God is quite clear about that. But sin is to do with our offending God. Of breaking his commands. Of falling short of his glory. Of cultivating a rebellious spirit in our hearts. Of thinking bad thoughts of him. And planning things that are displeasing to him. And being disloyal to him. The Bible says sin is to transgression of any law. God's law. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible also says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Who else nailed Jesus to the cross? Who else killed the Prince of Life? It was me and my sin that nailed him to the cross. That's what the Christian said. Let's look at three, th four things about this Prince of Life. He is the sacrifice. He willingly, voluntarily offered up himself, offered up his life to buy something. Not a new car. Not a helicopter. Not even a private jet. He didn't buy any of those things. Because they're worthless. When it comes to the things of God. No, he bought something far more precious. And far more wonderful. He bought salvation. He bought your salvation. And he bought mine. The Bible says he redeemed, we redeemed not with corruptible things. Such as silver and gold. But with the incorruptible Precious blood of Jesus Christ. You see here is sacrifice. And then here is something else. Secondly is substitution. Well I had substitution first. Or in my notes I had it second. But substitution. What does that mean? Well if you are looking at the World Cup you will know about substitution. The other night England apparently made eight changes. Or nine changes was it? And Belgium made eight changes to their football team. And you might think, oh, that's nice, that's substitution. Well, the substitution here is much more serious. Uh, the Bible says that the holy and the just was given in exchange for a murderer. Peter picks up this theme in his first epistle and says, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. Substitution. It's a wonderful word, we don't have time to go into it. But isn't it, isn't it so clear that they'd rather have a wicked, vile, cruel murderer called Barabbas rather than the perfect, sinless, spotless Jesus Christ? Is that not the biggest problem today in the world? Is that not the biggest problem with people? They'd rather have something that they can enjoy and they can live with rather than have Jesus Christ. I find that tragic. He's a great substitute. When he was dying on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago now, he was dying for me. Almost 2,000 years ago now, he was dying for me. Was he dying for you? That little word, far. It, it's, it's got a world of theology. and you know, We looked at it a few months ago in studying in the evening, but far. He, he died for me, says the apostle. He gave his life for me. A substitution. He died as our saviour. Oh, why did the prince of life lay down his life? Why did he voluntarily give it up to be our saviour? To be my saviour and your saviour. And then he's the victor. You might be familiar with this phrase in the Bible. It is finished. You might think that's a whimpering cry from a dying martyr. It's not. It's a victorious proclamation from victorious Lord. Victory! It's finished! 
I, the Prince of Life, have offered up my life for all my people, for all that will live in this world and come to me by faith. I will be victorious and I will be their Savior. Christ trampled under his feet all the powers of darkness. As the grapes are trod in the winepress, so Christ trod down the head of the devil. He overcame the prince of darkness. The prince of life on the cross overcame the prince of darkness. His patient suffering and painful death. He won for us, dear believers, the right to live forever. Christ was both victim as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, but he was also victor. Because we have peace through his blood. He's made a display of the powers of darkness at that time in Calvary. They were displayed as powerless and impotent compared to his victorious work of redemption. We don't have time to look at the next part, so let's look at the third part. The Prince of Life is Jesus Christ. The Prince of Life who died. The Prince of Life who rose again. This shouldn't be as small as this, so I'll read it out for you. Six things to remember about the resurrection. How often have you thought about the resurrection? Do you know it's a triune work? You sang it in one of the hymns this morning, didn't you? About the Trinity, the, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three different gods. But three God, three persons in one Godhead. Do you know in the Bible, Psalm 16, verse 10, and Acts 2, 24, and many other verses beside, show us that God the Father was at work in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, rising up. Let's just briefly look at that verse. It's just over the page. This is Peter's first sermon. Acts 2 and 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And this is referenced back to Psalm 16, verse 10. And then Christ himself is involved in the resurrection. He speaks about this in John chapter 2 and verse 19. And it's quite marvelous, but we haven't time to look at it. And, and the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. And you can look at these later if you like, if you've got time this afternoon on a beautiful sunny day. Just... Pick up these texts, write them down, and take them with you, and ponder them. But look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, and it's quite remarkable. And the Bible is very clear. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. There's a summary of the gospel. And this Lord, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the bedrock of Christianity. If he had not risen from the dead, we're fools. We're fools to worship the Lord Jesus Christ if he's still dead. Sadly, there are many people this morning in religious circles who are worshipping a dead Savior. That's sad. No, that's very sad. Why is it important? Because Paul tells us that our faith is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 14. His resurrection proves that he is able to not only save us, but to justify us. Romans 4 and verse 25. And in case you think, well, this is all lovely theology, but what about Peter? Peter tells us something wonderful, and I just want you to note this in passing. Verse 15, chapter 3 of Acts and 15, And kill the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are Don't you love that? Don't you love that? You have delivered him. You have denied him. You had him killed. But we have seen him risen up. Peter saw him that first evening. Jesus rose from the dead and all of a sudden he's in the room. And here he comes. There he is. It's not the apostles don't say, now here he comes. They say, here he is. And he says, shalom. 
And they say, it's the Lord. And the Lord Jesus appears the next week. On a Sunday evening. And he comes in and he just appears. And then he meets them at Galilee and they're out fishing. They shouldn't be fishing. For a fish, they should be fishing for men, but they're fishing for fish. And the Lord Jesus comes. There he is. And Peter gets out of the boat and starts wading through the water. Now, I, I find Peter a very interesting study in himself. Talk about impetuous. There's not even a thought. Hold on, is the water deep? Is there any jellyfish around? No, he, into the water he gets and he goes as fast as he can to the shore to meet the Lord. A couple of days previous, he had seen the Lord Jesus rise up, head first, soaring vertically into the atmosphere. We've seen him. We are witnesses. Oh, there's a world of truth here. Peter, you're just, as it were, giving us a few tidbits when you're saying, we are witnesses. The word here, witness, by the way, is the word that we translate as martyr. Marturio. This word witness bears such significance when we think of how Jesus died and Peter saw it all happen in Calvary and how Jesus rose from the dead. And Peter saw it all in Jerusalem and then in Galilee and how Jesus rose up into the glory at the day of ascension and how Peter bore witness to Jesus Christ until he too was crucified. What's the resurrection about? Let me give you these six things, the res truths. The resurrection is the core of the Christian message and should never be neglected or assumed. Secondly, belief in Jesus' physical resurrection is the defining doctrine of Christianity. Thirdly, the resurrection demonstrated to the whole universe that Jesus Christ is God. Number four, without the resurrection there would be no church. No church. No AIBC and no church, period. Fifthly, our neglect of Jesus' resurrection may be sadly one of the reasons our gospel preaching is so powerful, powerless. Some people think it's powerful if they don't talk about the resurrection. It's powerless. Jesus Christ wasn't just a nice man who died in a terrible way for poor unfortunates like you and me. He was the Son of God who gave his life voluntarily and he died on the cross he was buried in the tomb and he rose up the next day the resurrection gives us the joy of knowing that Christ is with us now the Lord Jesus is in the glory and he's here by his spirit this morning speaking to you dear friend and saying I'm the prince of life and I'm able to give you life and I'm able to give you abundant life. Oh, we had so many texts to look at. Super abundant life. Joy that you've never experienced before. Peace that you'll never experience outside of me. Forgiveness of sin that is only possible through believing in me. I am the Prince of Life. That's what he's saying to you. There was a time when I was in my religion. There was a time that I was an unbeliever. No, oh, I was a churchgoer. But I didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Life. I didn't know him. Fashions come and go. We were talking this morning, and I'll close with this. We were talking about fashion. What kind of things do you discuss on a breakfast in the morning? We talked about ants, and we talked about fashion. And what was in vogue and fashion in the 1970s is coming back in the, in the 20, almost 2020. 50 years later, it's quite astonishing, isn't it? Can they not think of anything new? Fashion of clothes. And fashion of lifestyle. And all these things come and go. But Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Prince of Life. When Peter was preaching this sermon, 
almost 2,000 years ago, and he's the Prince of Life this morning. He's the Prince of Life that gave his life at Calvary's tree. And he died and was buried and he rose again and he ascended into glory and he still remains the Prince of Life. He's my Prince of Life. I have to admit, I don't love him as I ought and neither do you, dear Christian. But he loves me. And he loves you, dear Christian. And nobody and nothing in this universe can take you away from Jesus Christ, the Prince of Life. No one and nothing. Hallelujah for that. But maybe there's someone here this morning and they're saying, well, what's this all about? Let me leave you this quote. The name is a beautiful name, this Prince of Life. Those seldom preached upon it is one of our Lord's famous titles. He'll be gloriously known by this name in the day of his appearing when he comes again. When the dead shall rise, it is a title which belonged to him before he was nailed to the cross, for they killed the Prince of Life, and it's a title that will remain with him forever. There is a world of truth. The Lord, the giver of life, he dies. Where? He dies on the cross. How? He dies in agony and shame. For whom? He dies bearing our sin. He dies to give life to all who will come to him by faith. Last thing. Today, think about the Prince of Life. Ask the Prince of Life to give you this spiritual life. Ask him to forgive you your sin. Ask him to give you a new heart. Talk to him. Talk to him in the song we're about to sing. Tell him just as I am without one plea. But what thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. Oh, come to him. He's got his arms wide open this morning to your friend. He hasn't got them closed like this. Frowning. Expecting you to do something to deserve forgiveness and peace with God. No. He knows you can't. But he's got his arms open. And he's saying, come to me. I am the Prince of Life. And I'll be your Prince now and forever. You see, we can repent and believe in Him. He'll not only be your Savior today, but there's one more line. He'll be your Prince of Life today and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing that lovely hymn. Just as I am without one plea. If you've got any questions, come and speak to me afterwards. It's wonderful to know the Lord Jesus. Don't think you have to be perfect to trust the Lord Jesus. You don't. You just have to come to him as you are. And we're going to sing that in our hymn. The ladies have just joined us, so that's wonderful. 342. Number 342. If you've never sung this hymn before, or if you've sung it before and haven't really understood the words, let me explain the first line. Just as I am without one plea, but what thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of, love of, Lamb of God, I come. I come. Can't you say that in your heart, young people? Can't you say that, dear friends? Can't you say that, looking in? I come. O Prince of Life, come and be my Savior. As we sing this hymn, maybe you'll make this your prayer. 342, let's all stand to sing.
someone here this morning. You're looking for this life. You're looking for forgiveness. You're looking for pardon. You're looking for a way to live. Maybe you need to make that your prayer. All I need in thee to find. Maybe there's some young people or older people here this morning that haven't yet committed their life to the Lord Jesus. You'll find so much more in the Lord Jesus than even any preacher will be able to share with you. Amen. Maybe there's someone here that hasn't come for baptism. And you're a believer and you want to walk with the Lord and you want to be involved in the work of the gospel. Come and speak to me after. Maybe there's someone who needs to be restored to the Lord. Maybe you haven't realized how much you've drifted from the Lord. Make this your prayer, dear friend, as we sing the last verse, Just As I Am. Thank you. Just as grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits. Amen. Please be seated. We've got a special treat this morning. Brother John.